Hey everyone, it's Paul with Reporting Live from my sofa. How are you today? I'm doing good. I've got my sofa. I've got my little Bailey girl here who will probably be photobombing us at some point. So today, you already saw the thumbnail. You already clicked the video. We are continuing with the Brent Christensen trial. Uh, we're going to be covering day five testimony in this video. Now, a quick recap here. If you're just starting us off, uh, of course, I suggest starting back at day one. This is a federal trial that's going on right now currently. And so there's no cameras or anything like that allowed in there. So I'm just referencing reporters notes and things of that nature and making commentary on that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. Okay, so on Tuesday the 15th, the morning of, the maintenance man John Clark, who went to service the bathroom, uh, got on the stand and testified. Now remember that Christensen had put a request in to have the, like, for mold cleanup in the bathroom a few days after Zong went missing and, you know, he murdered her. And so John Clark is who came and worked on the bathroom. Now Clark said that there was some peeling with the, the grout and whatnot, but that overall it really didn't look that bad and that there was some mold, but it wasn't really as Christensen had described it. He said that he sprayed mold remover and put some fresh caulk, caulk on the corners and basically he was there for maybe 30 minutes. Now another really interesting witness that testified was Emily Hogan. Now she was another University of Illinois grad student who was approached by a man pretending to be a police officer the morning that Zong went missing. Now remember, Christensen had, that was kind of his MO. He posed as a police officer and he had tried to get a young lady in her car, but she saw right through that and was like, no thank you. She had contacted the police, posted a Facebook post about it. You know, she did the right thing. Now in her testimony, she said that the, when she was approached by him, he said, I'm an undercover cop. Can I ask you a few questions? And she agreed and said yes to this. He then showed her something that had like a silver star on it and asked if she could get in the car. And she basically was like, no, I mean, this kind of startled her. And she started to back away and he acted surprised at this, she said. At that point when she called the police and made the Facebook post, you go girl. She says that a few days later, she recognized his photo in a police lineup and that she was surprised. She didn't expect to recognize anybody, but it was him she testified. And in fact, she went further to say that it made her sick to her stomach. I mean, she was very close to death. I'm sure this was very traumatic for her. And thank God she didn't get in the car. Now, some more testimony included an FBI forensics expert. Michael McGuire. He testified about his search about the Astra Christensen's car as well as the apartment and they were showing pictures of using an alternative light source that appears to show handprints above his bed. The alternative light source also highlighted body fluids and cleaning materials uh, but the defense did point out that it was not blood that it was highlighting. So the search that McGuire did with this alternative light source also showed a high reaction to luminol in the passenger seat of Christensen at Christensen's Astra, uh, but it still wasn't reaction. It wasn't a reaction to blood, so it seems that it was uh, a lot of cleaning took place in that front seat. Now another interesting bit of testimony came from Charles Hill. He was actually like a, not a cellmate, but he was also in jail with Christensen. Their cells were next to each other at the Macon County Jail in the summer of 2017. Now where their cells were located does indicate that he was in probably some kind of protective custody because it was in a separate area from the rest of the jail. Hill says that they were in their cells 23 hours a day, so that definitely tells me they were in protective custody of some sort. And he says that he talked to him almost all day long and he really took a liking to him. He says that Christensen's eventually told him that he did approach a girl posing as a police officer, got her in the car, but that he eventually just let her out. He made a wrong turn or something and let her out of the car. Hill told this information once he heard it from Christensen to a correctional officer who then relayed it to the FBI. And in general, Hill said that Christensen cried a couple of times being on the phone, but other than that, he would laugh and giggle, play cards, and kind of keep busy. So some more testimony that came was from a canine handler named Jeremy Bruchetta. Jeremy Bruchetta. And he testified that his dog alerted to the presence 
of a body underneath the vanity in Christensen's bathroom, but it didn't alert to a body anywhere else in the apartment. Now in cross-examination, the defense basically asked, why would this dog alert to something in the bathroom where no blood was recovered and not anywhere else in the apartment? And they don't seem to have, at least this reporter doesn't have an answer for that, but it's a good question. And also remember a quick side note, remember the, uh, the, the, the dog sniffing evidence that was present in the McCain case. If you haven't watched that or are familiar with the, the young girl who went missing uh, overseas and they brought in um, some canine dogs and there's it's controversial as to you know well this dog did this and this dog did that or whatever so I'm very interested if anyone has any information that's worked with you know dog sniffers like this and whatnot I would be curious to hear your you know thoughts in the comment section on this because I do think that's a very interesting question as to why the dog is not alerting to where blood is but it's my understanding that dogs can also have different techniques like one dog might be searching something specific out and so maybe that's why I'm not sure but let's continue now some more testimony came from Doug Saccombe. I'm probably butchering that name. Uh, but he was part of the FBI evidence response team that came to the scene. And they were there from about 7 a.m. until 5.30 p.m. doing stuff in the apartment. And then they took a quick break. Now once they were back from the break, Pollock, the defense, uh, examined Saccombe. And he confirmed that he's never cleaned a carpet before, among other things. Uh, the defense also tried to point out that it wouldn't make sense to only clean up in certain areas like the alternative light source I suggested was done. So then they got another FBI expert up there, Courtney Corbett, who basically got up there and just echoed what Saccombe said about the cleaning up in the apartment. She said the luminol did its reaction or whatever. Uh, in the bath bathtub, especially on the walls right above the tub. But again, later they learned that this is where the maintenance man had sprayed the tub with mold remover. So, side note on some of this stuff. It's interesting to see here how, I mean, for example, like this. I mean, to me, it's like, again, I don't know how this technology works and stuff, but just watching shows or whatever, I'm like, oh, well, you spray it, and then you see the blood, or you see this. So, it's interesting that they can sit here and say, oh, well, we sprayed it. It detected a lot of cleaning materials, but not any blood. So, it's interesting to learn in this case. I always look at these cases. If each one, I think, presents something different to learn or whatever. And so, for me, at least, I, and this one, I'm learning, oh, okay, cool. So, you know, I didn't know that this many things could throw something off, essentially, is what I'm getting at. So, let's get back to the testimony. So, after that, Pollock, the defense, continues to question her about the things that they took away from the apartment. And Corbett confirms that they took carpet, kitchen sink, drains, sink traps. And then the defense says they literally took the kitchen sink. Now, after that, they basically continue the case until 1.30 p.m. Uh, today, Wednesday. That's the day that I'm filming this. Uh, the judge has to go to a funeral this morning, and so they're going to start it this afternoon, so it'll be a little bit of a late start. Maybe I can catch up. Uh, I want to go over a couple of more things, though. This is just like one set of notes here from the testimony. So I want to go over a couple of things here that this person also wrote that I think is of interest. Now, also, they kind of floated around a schedule of you know events that are taking place in this, and it looks like by the end of this week, they could start the jury deliberating. So if that's the case, I mean, I'm just like, okay. I mean, I feel like this just started. Now, granted, they're sitting here, they're not trying to plea insanity. They plead not guilty at one point, but then got there and said guilty. So I think it's pretty interesting. Now, also, the defense isn't really sitting here, in my opinion, putting up some huge fight. Now, granted, we're only seeing the little bit that we're seeing from the reporters. So this could be drug out all day long. The defense could be fighting this and fighting that. We're just not seeing it. Now they're saying closing arguments by both attorneys could be maybe Thursday or Friday. So, I mean, maybe they're going to finish up testimony today. Now, another piece of interesting evidence that was shown in court on Tuesday on day five was a video. Now, during this video, Christensen is being questioned by the FBI. And it's about an hour long. Now, during this video, he changes his story several times. Now, at one point, he says he picked a girl up, but he wasn't sure where, and that she spoke broken English. One of the detectives testified that Christensen was trembling and broke out into hives when he was confronted about the inconsistencies in his story. Now, also on day five, and we've mentioned some of the luminol pictures and things of that, but this was like the first time that the jurors got to look inside the apartment at these pictures. And I mean, that's always going to be so haunting when you're seeing like the scene of a crime basically and not even I mean in this there's no you know bloody pictures to show 
or whatever, but just, you know, you're left to your imagination. It almost might be worse because now we're left to imagine the horrors that probably took place in there with this poor girl. So it really, it seems like this guy, you know, if you've been listening to the testimony and stuff like that, I mean, he bragged a lot. I mean, he was you know, idolized these serial killers, had these kind of, you know, alternative mm -hmm. type sexual fantasies that went into the devious, I guess you could say. And it really just looks like he ended up acting his most bizarre fantasies out on this young lady. And it's just an awful, awful story. And so it... It's interesting with these cases when we see these people who they talk real big and they're real big and bad and da 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 da. But now at the end of the day, you know, he's sitting here trembling when he's being confronted about his inconsistencies. You know, so, you know, another thing he tried to brag about his body count, but it looks like this is the only person he killed. And, you know, he talked about how good he was at killing. He wasn't good at it. He left all this evidence out. Now, again, what is peculiar is the fact that there is no body. And this is one thing I started wondering. I'm curious what y'all think about it. Because if he's trying to stay off death row, now he might have an ulterior plan to be like, I would rather go to the chair or whatever, uh, as opposed to life in prison. And so maybe that's why, the, you know, this trial's going by quick. They're not really putting up much of a fight or da-da-da-da-da. Um, but... I almost wonder if that's his get out of jail free card and not saying he's going to get out, but to basically be like leverage to say, look, I'll tell you where the body is. If you give me blank, uh, I'll tell you where the body is for life in prison. I'll tell you where the body is to get transferred to somewhere that I want to be at. You see what I'm saying? Something of that nature. It wouldn't surprise me because he seems egotistical and narcissistic enough to do something like that, to put her family through even more trauma than he's already caused. So that's kind of most of the testimony I want to discuss today about day five. So again, uh, drop your comments down below, start a conversation. Uh, don't forget we do have our Discord channel. I've put a specific channel on there to discuss Brent Christensen case. If you want to join there, it's free. Um, and other than that, I appreciate y'all hanging out with me. If you're still here, I appreciate it. I know it was a long video and, um, I will talk to y'all soon. Y'all have a good afternoon and I will see you later. Bye.